Friends, today we are continuing in our sermon series throughout the season of Lent called Trust the Process. We have our theme verse printed in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull that out so we can read this theme verse together as we will each and every week of our series. Read with me. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. This is the goal of our faith and it's the goal of Lent, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is a specific season in the life of the church where we do that. But how do we do that? That's what the series is all about trying to find those spiritual practices, those ways to connect with God that maybe you've tried and maybe you haven't tried before. Our series, Trust the Process, comes from the mantra found in many sports teams, but especially from the Philadelphia 76ers, this idea that if you fall in love with the process, the results will follow. And that's so important in our spiritual faith, to find a spiritual practice, to find a way to connect with God that you love doing, that you're drawn to, Because it's so easy to focus on the results. It's so easy to wish we had a deeper faith, to wish that we had these things, these results, but we know that it's a long process. And so if we can find a way to fall in love with that process and trust that it will work, we know that our faith will follow and God will be with us. So each week we're looking at a different spiritual practice, encouraging you to try these different things, maybe for the first time, seeing if there's a part of this process in your spiritual journey that you might fall in love with and help you to draw closer to God. Last week we talked about fasting. I hope that you tried fasting from something this week to see how it went. I continue my fast from coffee. Um, Every time I say that, I feel like I should say, you know, my name is Alex and it's been 22 days since I've had my last cup of coffee. But I've given up coffee for Lent and it's gotten much easier as I've gone through it. And so I hope that you tried fasting and your experience was positive. Today we are talking about giving. How do we live generously with our money, our time, and our spirit? How can we be marked by generosity? How can we be known as a generous person and why should we do that? Today's scripture comes from the second letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. In the ninth chapter beginning in verse 5, this is also in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. This is why I thought it was necessary to encourage the brothers to go to you ahead of time and arrange in advance the generous gift you have already promised. I want it to be a real gift from you. I don't want you to feel like you are being forced to give anything. What I mean is this. The one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a small crop. And the one who sows a generous amount of seeds will also reap a generous crop. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need, always and in everything, to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, he scattered everywhere, he gave to the needy, his righteousness remains forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning seeking to understand what it means to be generous. We know that you are generous with us, and we seek to be like you. So help us today to better understand what that means with our resources, our time, our energy, simply the way we treat others and ourselves. God, open this letter so that we might hear a fresh word from you today. God, we love you and we trust you. This is your house, and we are your people, and we will listen. Speak to us this morning, O God. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. This scripture contains a famous phrase that we hear a lot, especially whenever the church starts to talk about money. God loves a cheerful giver. I heard that first when I was a young child, and I've heard it constantly throughout church. God loves a cheerful giver. And when I heard that growing up, I always laughed. I thought, well, that sounds nice, but... I I don't know if that's really how it works for most people. And as I got older and had money of my own and was a young adult and the church came and said, you know, we should be generous and give. And I thought, all right. And they said, but God loves a cheerful giver. And I said, look, man, you can have my money or I can be cheerful, but you can't have both. I'll do it, but do I have to be happy about it? And it always felt manipulative. It always felt like, you know, you have to give to the church, but you should be happy about it. And I'm like, this feels like an abusive relationship. 
And that's because I misunderstood giving. Giving always felt like a burden when I was younger. It always felt like something that everyone sort of felt awkwardly obligated to do, but nobody really wanted to. And a lot of that is because, though I had heard this phrase, God loves a cheerful giver, I had never read the rest of this chapter. I didn't know what Paul was talking about. I couldn't have even told you that it was Paul who said that. And so he explains what he means in this. Paul says, I don't want you to feel like you are being forced to give anything. He says, you shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. And by the way, that's how we feel here at Ridgewood Park. We don't want you to feel pressured to give. We don't want you to feel obligated. We don't want you to feel awkward. We're not about that. When we say God loves a cheerful giver, we mean that. We're not trying to manipulate you. We want everyone to give because they want to support the ministry of God here. They want to be a part of that. It's not about obligation. It's not about guilt. It's about supporting the ministry of God because God has transformed us. But this isn't just about money, so I want to zoom out because I'm talking about generous, generosity in general, the way we live as a generous person, the way we spend our time, our energy, the way we treat others, the way we treat ourselves. What does it mean to be a generous person? What does it mean to give to others of the things that we have? We focus a lot on money, but it's often the other things that are even harder to be generous about. How generous are we when we get cut off on 75 on our morning run, commute into church, our morning commute into work? Hopefully, when you're coming to church, you're a little kinder, but how generous are we to one another? What Paul is trying to say here is that giving is good for our soul. He's trying to show us the way to find abundant life. He's not out here trying to raise a bunch of money. He's trying to raise people to abundant life. We are made in the image of a generous God. That's why giving is good for our soul. Because the more that we are generous, the more we look like the God that we were created to look like. God is generous. God gives unconditionally. God gave us everything, including free will. God gave us the ability to say, no thanks, and walk away. God gave us everything. And so when we are generous, we are like God. And Paul says, you get back what you put in. Not that it's transactional, but that if you invest in the work of God, it'll mean more to you. If you invest in the people around you, those relationships will be deeper. You will get back what you sow. Paul literally says, this is what I mean. I love it in scripture when there's a phrase like that, because you know he's looking around and no one gets what he's saying. And he's like, okay, this is what I mean. Let me break it down for you. Let me clarify the one who sows a small crop will reap a small crop, but the one who sows generous will reap generously. So if this is true, why don't we live generously? I think it's probably because our society is largely built upon the accumulation of wealth and possessions and status. That's what most of our media and most of our culture tells us to do. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that we've been taught to have a mindset of scarcity, that there's not enough and we have to get all that we can. Instead of a mindset of abundance, we're afraid to run out of things. We think there's not going to be enough to go around. And in our culture, our status is largely determined, determined by what I have compared to you, right? What's the phrase we use? Keeping up with the Joneses. It's about how much do you have compared to your neighbors. We have status symbols all over the places. Houses, cars, and brands of clothing. We have even made it into the water bottles that we drink. Have you noticed that? Like today, the hot cup is the Stanley cup with the handle and the straw, right? If you've got one of those, whoo, you are to be envied. How silly is that? A water bottle is a status symbol, but it is. We have all of these status symbols in our culture, and it's largely based on what I have compared to what you have. We're put in competition. We're meant to hold on to everything we have, to gather more and more and more. Most of us can probably name some of the richest people in our country and our world. Why? Because we're obsessed with who can get the most, who can be the king of the hill, who can have so much money they could never spend it. We don't even conceptualize the level of wealth that we have in certain places. I saw this the other day, and I had to go through and do the math to see if it was true. We talk about the richest people in our world. If Jesus Christ had a job that paid him $1,000 an hour, $1,000 an hour, and he worked 40 hours a week from the time he was born in year zero until 2023, he wouldn't even crack the top 10 richest people. That's how much money that we hoard in our culture. If you made $1,000 an hour for over 2,000 years, you can do the math if you want. I didn't believe it. 
That's what we're talking about. We're obsessed with accumulating things, with comparing ourselves to one another, and it makes us feel like there's not enough. It makes us hold tight to what we have and compete with one another. There is societal pressure and incentive to be selfish and not generous. And this is so pervasive, we even do it to ourselves. I have always loved the concept of save the best for last. I don't know why, but I like that idea. It's always been something that I've held on to. You save the best part for last. But somewhere along the line, I, I took it too far, and it didn't become helpful anymore. I was always afraid to use the good stuff because I was saving it. I was saving it for something. What was I saving it for? I don't know, but I was saving it for something because you have to save the best for last. You can't just go through the best parts of everything. And this most commonly shows up when I'm eating. So you've got a good dessert in front of you, right? Maybe you've got like a brownie or a cake or something, right? How many of you are like me where you try to carve it out so that last bite is perfect? It's got every element. It's the, you know, the juiciest or whatever your preferred, you know, for me it's the middle of the brownie. I'm a middle of the brownie kind of person. I saw an infomercial for a brownie pan that's edges only. It's like a snake that makes only edge pieces. And I was like, what kind of sociopath wants edge pieces only? Right? Okay. Amen. Okay, we're going to have a staff party where we eat brownies because you guys can have all the edges and I can just have the middle piece. A few years ago for my birthday, Emma made me a brownie and I walked in and I said, you know what, it's my birthday. And I scooped out the middle of it. And she turned to me and she said, what kind of a monster are you? <laughs> I said, it's my birthday. I want this middle piece. But I'll save the best for last. But the problem is, if you're like me, I cut too big of a dessert every time. My eyes are 10 times the size of my stomach, and so I'm eating a dessert, and I'm saving the best piece for last. But what happens when you've eaten too much dessert? Well, you don't want that last piece. You're just shoving it in, right? It's a matter of principle. You have to finish it. And it's not good. And so we're wasting the best part. We save the best for last only to not enjoy it. The suit that I'm wearing today is my favorite suit. It's like blue, it's not quite powder blue, it's not quite navy blue, it's bold, but it's not flashy, it's just right. <laughs> and I love this suit. But it's the one that I wear the least often, because it's the special one. It's my favorite one. I'll wear all the rest of them constantly, but I won't wear this one, because it's the, I literally don't wear my favorite suit because it's my favorite suit. We buy fancy china that we never use. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, it's not dishwasher safe. Look, I'm one of those crazy people that hand washes everything before it goes into the dishwasher anyway, so that's not stopping me. But we have boxes of china we've never used. Why do we do this? It's because many of us live with a mindset of scarcity. We have to save it or we might run out. But if we never enjoy it, what's the point of holding on to it? Jesus even told a parable about this. He said, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. It's a pretty good problem to have, right? My wallet's too small for my 50s. And then he said, I will do this. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul? I love that he talks to himself. I will say to my soul, soul, you have done good. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God and others. Friends, we can't find abundant life if we live with a mindset of scarcity. If we're holding on to everything that we have for dear life. We can't grow the body of Christ if we're constantly competing with one another. A lot of times we look at the church across the street or down the road and we think, oh, we're in competition, right? We've got to get out before those Baptists do. We feel like we're in competition with one another, even within our own denomination. Oh, did you hear that church is planting a church right down the road? They're encroaching on our territory, right? Oh, did you hear so-and-so? They moved, right? And they're going to this other church now. Oh, traitors, <laughs> right? Like it's college football or something, right? Like, I mean, there's some, there's some you know, betrayal that cuts deep. But that's not true in the church. We're all on the same team. Yesterday, we had an important but very difficult meeting in our annual conference. We gathered together with the clergy and lay representatives of our annual conference for a special session where we dealt with some logistics about insurance, but primarily to approve 
the vote of disaffiliating churches. As you know, there's a lot of turmoil in our denomination, and some churches have elected to leave the United Methodist Church. There's a process that they go through. And the final piece of that was we as a conference had to certify and vote to approve that disaffiliation. There were 41 churches, is that right, Edwin? 41 churches. And it was painful. It was painful to see these siblings, to see these pastors and laity, to hear names of churches that we knew, and to know that we're no longer going to be connected in our denomination. And it was hard. But in that moment, there was a strange peace. There was a strange, strange collegiality. There was a strange... Holy Spirit moment happening because before we held that vote or maybe right after we read the Apostles Creed and we sang hymns we read scripture in that moment it was so apparent to everyone in that room that we've been fighting like cats and dogs over these things in our denomination viewing each other as enemies seeing the division watching our church go through this crisis it's a lot of animosity a lot of lines that have been drawn, a lot of pain. And yet in that moment, as we read the Apostles' Creed together, and as we sang those hymns, and as we stood together and sang, blessed be the tie that binds, I realized almost everybody in this room agrees on just about everything. And though we will not be in the same denomination, we will still be Methodists. There's 84 different versions of Methodists in the world. We are still united with Christians, even beyond the Methodist Church, in the Baptist Church, in the Catholic Church. We celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion today to remind us that we are connected, not just in this room or with other United Methodists or with people who look or think or believe like us, but with people across time and space and throughout history who profess the name of Jesus Christ. There is so much more than unites us, than divides us, and yet, even though 99% of the things that we agree on, we have focused for the last five years on the 1% that we disagree on, and it's turned us into enemies because we live in a world that does that to us. We live in a world that says, get everything you have and all others are a threat, that sees enemies everywhere. We don't live in a world that opens our hands in generosity. We say we have open hands and open hearts, open doors, open minds. There's only three of those, I added one, but we open everything in the United Methodist Church. And the reason that we say that is because we want to live in the image of God, which is about opening ourselves up to others and living generously. Christ says we're called to be like children, and this is one area where I think it's easier to understand why. Because children live in abundance. Kids share their snacks with their friends like they're never going to run out. They'll give it away to everybody. You want some Cheerios? My mom has all of them. They think that they're just never going to run out. Kids will share anything because they live in a world of abundance. They don't think about how much things cost or storage. They're not building barns to store things. They're giving it away. They're playing with their friends. They're living in the moment. They live with open spirits generously with one another. A life of abundance is generous and bold, declaring, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. A life of abundance is what built this church. For nearly 70 years, our spiritual ancestors looked to the future and said, we can do all things through Christ. They built this church into what it is today. And they made sure that we continued that mission. We continued looking forward with hope. And that's why after church today, we are going to celebrate and vote on our capital campaign to keep moving forward. Because friends, that legacy of generosity and abundance will not die with us. Amen? Amen. Friends, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But only if we are generous like God is generous. Only if we let ourselves live in abundance and not spend our entire life working so hard to get all we can to hold on to it so maybe later we'll have fun in retirement. Life is too short. When we have a generous spirit and live with our hands open instead of our hands clenched so tightly to what we have, ready to fight those who dare to take it from us, when we open our hands we find peace. We're able to live in that generous spirit and that abundant life that Paul is talking about and that Christ came to bring us. So as you go throughout this week, see what happens if you choose to live in the abundance of Christ. Open your hands and your spirit to others. Share your snacks like a three-year-old on the playground and see what happens. My bet is you'll feel peace and God will show up. Let's pray. God of grace and love, we come to you today because you are a God of generosity. 
You are a God that gave us our very life and our very breath. You gave us free will. You bless us with so many things that we take for granted. But God, we live in a world not defined by generosity. We live in a world defined by scarcity and competition, fear and enemies. So God, help us, as Romans says, to be transformed. Not to conform to that way of thinking where we see others as the other, but as we see others as sisters and brothers in Christ, made in the image of God. Lord, we need your help, because this is not what our world makes easy for us. We need you to help us to be generous. So open our hearts and open our spirits, that we may be generous as you are generous. And let it begin as we receive grace here at this table. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.